Hey everybody, welcome to Fluid Effects in Houdini. My name is Spencer Leaders and I'm an effects supervisor at Sony Pictures Imageworks. Uh, thanks so much for joining me on this course. We're gonna cover a variety of different topics. We're gonna kind of start off fairly straightforward with um, particles, get into a little vellum fluids. Um, we're gonna use the shallow water solver. We're also gonna do a bit of transformation matrices uh, to create some procedural animation on some leaves and whatnot. We're then gonna get into some much larger scale effects, which is oftentimes a challenge to do in visual effects. And while the techniques are relatively straightforward, I think what you'll see is they'll achieve a really nice large scale effect. So hopefully the fundamentals are straightforward enough and then it's really about building on them and piecing them together to create these much larger splashes and we'll get into some rigid bodies and things like that. So there's quite a lot of ground to cover. So um, yeah, I think we should just dive right in and, and get started. Okay, so let's dive right in. For this scene, we're going to create a few different elements that we're going to kind of layer together. And so let's start with the drips coming off of our roof as the first element. So when creating a few different elements for a scene, it's always good to kind of organize them into separate geometry objects. It makes assigning materials and locating where things are and controlling them a little bit easier. So let's create a geometry object and let's call this drips. Before we dive into drips, let's actually just take a quick look at the ENV. And in here you can see it's broken out into a few different layers. We got plants, roof, house, extra stuff. So let's dive into drips and let's create an object merge. And let's bring in our roof. And there we go. So something that's also important when you're starting an effect is to kind of evaluate the inputs, being the frame range, your camera, what the camera's doing, um, as well as the geometry or the models that you're bringing in. So we'll take a look at this roof and it's pretty standard. We kind of come around here. You can see there is no thickness to these tiles. It's just single-sided face. Um, they're kind of jamming in the tiles here. They're just getting clipped there. So in Houdini, a lot of our effects need to uh, require manifold topology. Uh, the models need to be have thickness to them. They need to be enclosed. So oftentimes we do need to rebuild assets that we do bring in. The other thing I want to look at is if you middle mouse, we can look and see what attributes are coming in with this model. The one I want to put your attention to is the P scale. Uh, if we look at the geometry spreadsheet over here, we can see the values of the P scale and they're all zero. So that actually can get you into trouble as this attribute would flow through any nodes that you're creating. Uh, and the reason is, is because P scale is a reserved attribute in Houdini for setting the radius of a point. And then that also filters into a variety of different nodes. Uh, so oftentimes if you put a node down and you've got this P scale with a value of zero, the node isn't doing what it's supposed to do because it's expecting there to be some kind of positive value on that P scale. So let's go ahead and just delete that with an attribute delete. And off you go. All right, so it's no longer there. Uh, if you want to delete that U attribute, and you know you can delete these others if you want. It's important to keep UVs though. All right, so now let's just kind of rebuild this geometry that's going to work for us. Uh, the the end goal, just so you're aware, is we want the drips to be emitting kind of off these end pieces here, these end tiles here. We don't really want it emitting anywhere on the roof. Uh, we just kind of want to be pouring off these edges. We don't also really want it to be emitting from the underside here. So with all those things considered, let's rebuild this uh, as just in a really basic way. Um, and that's using a shrink wrap. And what this does is this creates a convex hull 
around our geometry. So basically it looks at all the, the points of the geometry and figures out where the extremes are and creates this, again, convex hull. Let's create a remesh just to give it a little bit more definition. And let's set the target size, something like 0, 05 get more definition and then we can create a ray and we'll plug our remesh into our first input and our attribute delete into our second and then I'm going to hit shift s to just change my noodles to be curvy uh, so we're going to ray and change from project rays to minimum distance so it's really just going to find the nearest uh, surface and just push our points to those. So obviously it doesn't look pretty back here. It really doesn't look pretty all over, but for the sake of what we're doing, again, we want to be emitting from these kind of ends here. And the analysis that we want to perform on this geometry, this is going to suit our needs. There's a variety of different ways of rebuilding geometry with VDBs and all that sort of thing. Um, but for the sake of our example here, this is probably going to work. All right, but as I just said, VDBs. So one thing I want to do is use a node uh, called VDB Potential Flow. And let's just drop that down. We're not going to connect it yet. So we have to do something before. But what this node does is you give it an incoming vector, okay, this background velocity value here. And it's going to then analyze the VDB you feed in and look at how the air would flow around that piece of geometry. So this is really useful for like a wind tunnel sort of vectors or velocities. So in order to use this node though, we first need to create a VDB. So let's create a VDB from polygons. And let's just go ahead and plug that in here. And we can turn this resolution down to something like 0, 2. And then we'll plug this in. Give it a second. And OK, visually, it looks no different. Um, if I middle mouse, so we can see our original VDB created a surface field, which basically stores the, it's, it creates what's called an SDF. and that stores in each voxel of our of this surface field the distance from the surface so voxels that live outside the model are positive values is a positive distance uh, any voxel inside the volume is a negative number and then obviously at the surface is zero or very close to zero all right, so VDB potential flow, if we middle mouse, we can see we have the surface, and then we've got this new field now, flow vel, and you can see it's a vector three. So that means they're storing three values in this field, an X, a Y, and a Z. And it's all relative to this background velocity. So let's kind of imagine this air were rain, okay? So rain falls down, so let's do negative one. And again, not much changes. So in order to visualize this a little bit better, let's create a volume slice, often volume slice. Um, this is always a good way to kind of really check out what velocity fields are doing. Now, okay, there's colors there, but remember we've got two fields, so it's probably doing it for both fields. Uh, so let's go ahead and just get rid of our surface field because we don't really need that. All right. So we should just have our flow velocity. Yep. All right. So we now have colors representing the R, G, and B, which is fine. That again doesn't really tell us that much. So let's now append a volume trail. It's, because this is a velocity field, it's oftentimes useful to look at things using a vector or in other words, lines. Um, okay, so we plug our volume velocity or our volume velocity volumes in the second input and the points which we want to create trails from. So basically it's going to analyze each point and it, that point is going to sample the voxel 
the field at that location, and then it's going to create a, a, a line or a trail. And there we go. All right. So if we were to now manipulate our offset, because remember, we're just looking at a slice of this field. We get towards the end, you can see, okay, this is the end of our roof. So if we were to just take a look at this guy here, you can look at and see what the velocity trails are doing. They're all flowing down this way and then they curve around here. The other nice thing about this is we can see where this color is getting more intense. I think it's using an inf yeah, infrared visualization. You can change it to whatever you want. Um, but you can see this is also giving us the magnitude or the length of that vector. Um, so you can see these higher curvature areas have more intensity. So we can use this information now to figure out, okay, where do we want to emit our geometry? So because this is really intense on the edges, I think that's going to be useful for us to determine and isolate the regions where we want to emit our rain from. All right, so let's go back to our original model up here. And we want to apply that information we got from that potential flow. So this, remember, is just for our visualization. So let's move that over. Let's create an attribute wrangle. And what I want to do is similar to what this volume trail does, where it samples each point of the volume slice and applies that value. I want to do the same with our geometry here. I want each one of these points to sample this flowvel vector field, and we can then map the intensity of that onto our roof. So let's plug it in there. So right now, this potential flow is outputting a vector field. But our visualization is outputting just a color or an intensity. I mean, yes, this is different colors, so it's a vector. But if we look at grayscale, kind of the same deal. So, so what I want to do is, is I want to actually map the magnitude or the length of this velocity field onto our roof. So let's create a VDB analysis. And what it's going to do is take this incoming flow vel. It's going to analyze it using one of these methods. Um, and you've got these helpful indicators here of the field it's expecting and then what it's going to return. Uh, the one we want is length. So it's going to take a vector field and output a scalar field. And if we look now, we can see our flow vel is now a float. And that's fine. All right. So in our wrangle, now that we have our float field that's storing our length, we want to sample it. So we can use a function called volume sample. And the volume sample function, if I just type it. And then when you put the first parentheses, it does do this pop up help. You can see the usage here and what it does. Uh, it returns a float. Um, you give it the geometry that you want to sample, the primnum or the, the field you want to sample, and then the position which you're sampling from, meaning each point, in this case, it'll be each point of our roof. Well, first we need to create a float because that's what it returns. Let's just type VS for volume sample. Uh, it's really arbitrary. Okay, we want to sample the first input or the second input. Sorry, one, zero is the first, one is the second. Now it's acting asking that primnum, which is going to be zero, and then the position at which we want to sample the vector field from. So it's going to be each and every point, so at P. And let's just go ahead just to see what's going on at CDVS. CD is our color attribute. 
and it's a reserved color attribute. So, and look, there we go. All right, not bad. If I go into wireframe, you can see a little bit better. Now we still have things kind of showing up on the rooftop as well as the underside, which is uh, we can kind of now refit these values to try and filter out some of the, these areas. So let's create a new float for a parameter and call it min and type ch min. And then let's create a max, max, ch, max. And now we can fit our volume sample between our min and max. And then what do we want our new range to be? And we'll just say zero and one. So we're basically creating some thresholds and wherever the max value is gonna be, we'll return one, wherever the min is gonna be zero. And then it's just going to linear interpolate in between the, those values. If you wanted to, you know, put some different smooth curve or Bezier, things like that, you would need to then funnel it into a ramp. But uh, for the sake of what we're doing, we're fine. Okay, so everything goes white, and that's just because our min and max are zero. If I put this back to one, kind of turn that up, turn this down, you get more intense, more intense areas, start crushing those lower values. All right, but as we can see, don't know if we're really going to resolve all of that. So I don't know if we're going to be able to filter all of this out. So let's kind of take a look and think about what other properties could we analyze with our roof. And oftentimes in effects, this is what we, you know, we, we really have to kind of sit and look at it and find similarities and differences and things like that to, to kind of figure out how we can isolate stuff procedurally. All right. Well, the one thing I do want to point out is when we look at the faces and the directions they're pointing of where we want to emit. So most of these faces are kind of at a perpendicular to Y, right? They're not pointing down really, they're not pointing up. All these ones that we wanna filter out are largely biased pointing up or they're pointing down. They're on the underside here. And obviously rain wouldn't be kind of collecting and pouring off on the undersides here. I think it's fairly safe to say that most of these faces are pointing outward. So I think in the next video, we'll take a look at something called the dot product, and we can use that to now filter out our things further. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the dot product and what that is. Um, the dot product is a way to analyze and output a scalar value, meaning a single value that correlates to how two vectors align. Okay, so that that's kind of a complicated way of saying, we're just going to look at two directions and see how parallel or perpendicular or opposite those things are. And it's going to give us a number based on that. And that number falls between negative one and one. So in this picture here, um, so say our the vector we want to analyze against to see how closely they align. So I've got this picture here, and I've got this red vector and this blue vector here. Uh, let's say the blue is the vector we want to see how close our red aligns to. Well, right now, our red vector is perpendicular to our blue. So in that case, it will return a value of zero. If we were to rotate this to be vertical, because these two vectors align perfectly, it would return one. If this red vector were negative or pointing the opposite, it would return negative one. 
obviously this way, it'd also be zero. So here would be 0 0.5, 45 degrees would be 0 0.5. And it doesn't matter, this vector can be anywhere. It doesn't care spatially where it is uh, when it's doing that analysis. It just looks at the, the orientation of the vector, the two vectors and says, okay, this is how they relate to each other. So it's a really useful thing. Um, the first time I actually ever came across this, this was um, one of the first places I worked. Uh, it was how to emit particles only behind a sphere that was traveling in a, the sphere was traveling in a specific direction. And I just wanted to emit particles from the, the back of it. Um, so we looked at the dot product and said, okay, any, so say if this circle were traveling up, anything that had a threshold between zero and negative one, emit particles and anything above wouldn't. So anyways, you can use it to, to analyze those sorts of things. All right, so with that said, uh, I'd like to do the same because when we talked about, okay, what are some, some comparisons that we have, uh, we were kind of looking at most of these faces are perpendicular to the direction of the rain, i.e. negative, the negative y axis. So let's go ahead and create an attribute wrangle again. And before we start typing code, let's think about the two vectors we want to analyze. Okay, we're going to give it the rain direction, similar to what we did on our uh, VDB potential flow. We're going to give it this negative one. So let's go ahead and write that vector dir or direction. And let's actually, uh, we can create a parameter just so you guys can try a few different things. So we've got that. And I'm using CHV, the V creates a, a vector parameter. Uh, the default usually just creates a float. Now, what's the other vector we wanna compare against? And I know you clever kids out there are gonna be like, oh, well, we can look at the normal. Well, it yes, but we may also get into trouble because this is a pretty detailed sort of surface. We might be getting some other faces in there that we don't really want. So we can actually, from our shrink wrap, we can create a normal off of this and use that as the direction. And we can actually create a VDB from polygons. Oh, let's just do zero two again. And let's feed this guy into the second input. And what I want to do is similar to what we did up here where we're sampling our volume. I want to do the exact same down here. Now I know you could copy and paste, but we're here to learn. So we're going to create a vector and we'll call it grad. And we're going to do a volume sample, but it's a different type. We're going to sample the gradient. Volume gradient. And it accepts the same sort of arguments that the volume sample does. Uh, we need the volume which we want to sample, which is 1. And the primitive is zero, and we want to sample at the location of our point positions. So we've got two vectors now, our direction and grad, which we can compare against. But let me just talk briefly about our uh, gradient. So what is the gradient? Well, I mentioned before, here, let's pull up our whiteboard. So say we have our object here, right? And we turn this this our object into a VDB. Well, that SDF that is being created is storing the distance the voxel is from the surface. So we'll just say this guy, this voxel, we'll just say this box is negative one. This voxel here is negative two. This voxel here is negative three, and so on. Now this one here will be one, this will be two, and this will be three. That's a three. Um, 
interior values are always negative, exterior values are always positive, and that's how it knows whether or not a, a particle or a point or whatever, if it's inside or outside, and that's how a lot of collisions are are figured out. It says, whoa, you're inside. It's a negative number now. Uh, we got to get you out. Well, and how does it get it out? Or how does it say, hold on a second, you do not belong in here, for example, in particle collisions? Well, it computes what's called the gradient. Now, the gradient is analyzing, so it looks at the voxel, which say is negative three. It looks at all the surrounding voxels here and says, okay, what is the direction that values are increasing? And therefore, in this case, negative three, negative two, negative one, the direction is going to be pointing towards the surface. That is called the gradient. Okay, so it's analyzing this scalar field and returning the gradient. And so that's what we're doing here. We're grabbing that. And if you were to do, just to visualize a bit better than what I what I could draw, we do a VDB analysis on this. And here we go, operator, gradient, scalar to vector. And we have our visualization guy here. All right, sure enough, you can see all these vectors are pointing outwards. And as we Shift, you can see they're all pointing out. All right, so we're gonna use that now to feed into our dot product. All right, now remember the dot product returns a float between negative one and one. So let's do a float dot equals dot. And you can see the two inputs, it expects two vectors. All right, so we've got our dir and grad. Now, here's something that's really important when you're doing something like the dot product. It's always important to normalize our vector, uh, which basically means it gives the vector a length of one. Because a lot of times in, in, in effects, you know, especially with velocities and things like that, all these vectors have a magnitude that can be, you know, much bigger than one, smaller than one, everything else. And these computations, whether it's dot products, cross products, et cetera, it's all doing multiplication. So it's important to just make sure we're always comparing apples to apples, so to speak. Uh, so we're gonna normalize that. And assuming the user is just going to give a value between, you know, negative one and one, but it's always good just to make sure, even if they give a negative two or negative 10, um, it'll still output what we're expecting. All right, so let's take a look at, just visualize what dot is returning. Ah, it's not going to return anything useful because we have not actually defined our direction. So let's go ahead and push this button to expose our parameter. And if we just set this to one, all right. So all the values that are pointing or all the faces that are pointing straight up are getting this white color and everything else, it's really tough to tell um, because again, remember this goes between negative one and one. If we were to set this to negative one, you would see we're getting all the underside faces. And just to confirm that this is behaving, ah, we can see, okay, the color value is negative one. And there's a lot of zeros and so on. Something though that's that's interesting that I did forgot to mention is okay, all these zeros, right? We already know, like, okay, there's not that many faces that are perfectly perpendicular. No face is rarely perfectly perpendicular. Uh, there should at least be some kind of value in there. And the reason for that is on our VDB from Polygon, well, VDBs do this thing to make it really efficient, is only create voxels where it thinks it's going to be necessary. And it uses these exterior interior bands, uh, which means we'll populate 
the distance value, three voxels from the surface on the interior, as well as three voxels from the surface on the exterior. And then everything else, we're just not even gonna bother computing. So you can obviously crank these up, um, but an option that we want is fill interior, which means it's gonna populate all the voxels that are inside this, this geometry we're creating the VDB from. And you can also look, if you middle mouse on the VDB from Poly, Okay, we're at almost 2 million voxels here. If I uncheck this, it's going to be significantly less, 671,000 voxels. So, you know, it is important for resource management and stuff to keep that in mind, but, uh, you know, those are pretty low numbers, uh, so we're, we're fine. All right, so now that we have that, we can see, okay, there's more. All these now are changing color. So you can see that difference. So we can see now we have healthy values ranging between negative one and one. All right, that's all well and good. Let's set this back to one. So it's all the top faces, that's great. Um, but we really don't want the faces that are pointing straight up that are aligned. So we could put the direction to be an X, but that I don't think is really gonna give us what we want because we have faces pointing both on the X and Z axis. So remember how I said quickly uh, that up here on the fit, we could remap this. Right now it's just doing a linear interpolation. Well, let's go ahead and fit this first, this dot value. Um, so let's create a new float. And let's, and we're actually going to control that with a ramp. So first let's fit one, one, our dot to be between zero and one. All right. So what is fit one, one, fit one, one. So there's, maybe you guys are familiar with, there's a, um, a helpful expression called fit zero one, which it assumes the input falls between zero and one. And then you're just specifying the new min and new max out here. There's also one called fit one one, which is assuming this input, this first argument falls between negative one and one, which our dot product does. And then we're just mapping it to be between zero and one. Now that we have this between zero and one, we can create a ramp. Ramp equals ch ramp. So ch ramp needs uh, the name of the ramp. So we're just gonna call it I don't know, dot ramp. That's entirely up to you. Uh, and then the value we're going to remap with this ramp is called ramp. It's going to be this zero to one range. The ramp, the CH ramp always requires, I don't know if it's a requirement, but let's just say it's a requirement, uh, needs to have values between zero and one. That's, that's why I did that up there. Okay that and now let's actually change our color to ramp oh it's not creating oh you know what i think it is okay i don't think you're allowed to actually put a space in between there let's call it dot ramp sure yeah okay Gener and generally and I, I should know better uh you never really want to be using spaces anywhere all right yeah there we go okay uh, all right, so this is our zero to one ramp now. If I were to say, pull this middle area up, this down area, okay, and we can say, put this at 0 0.5. All right, we are now isolating. We're no longer really getting the top faces. All right, we got some of this stuff behind here, but that's fine. But we're only get, really getting the side faces. So this is exactly what we want. But we also really like this distribution where we're just getting it on these ends and we've got some nice, you know, kind of variation in there and whatnot. So what we can do is we've got this color, we've got that color before us. Instead of doing CD equals ramp, which just stomps on whatever color is being fed in, Let's do CD times equals ramp. And there we go. All right. So now I think we're pretty good. Uh, the only thing is 
we have it on the back side here. We don't really want to be emitting, but when we look through our camera, we don't see it. So I think we're ready to start sourcing our particles and creating these drips. But keeping in mind that we are simulating and, and we always want to try to keep our simulations efficient, let's just go ahead and chop off all of that stuff back there. And an easy way to do that is just use a clip sop. And let's set the direction on the Z axis. And then let's just pull this back to around there. Just want to make sure. Yeah, good. OK. All right. So in the next video, we'll actually start getting in the business of simulating. All right. So we have our roof and where we want to emit from. And let's go ahead and start setting up our actual emitter. So we've got our white color here, and that's where we want to emit from. So we've got a few different options. Let's go ahead and start with this option just to kind of get a basic framework. Just know we're going to be changing this around a little bit, but, it, you know, more for the purpose of instruction. I think it's important to kind of just build this piece by piece. So we do have the option. We could scatter a bunch of points in those areas and then emit from those points, which is all well and good. And now remember, we're, you know, you can do this and uh, put CD in there. And we're just going to largely get most of our points located there. And I think something that's worth noting, though, is we are still getting some points there. So what we can do is but go back up to our ramp here and kind of really crush these values so we're only getting on the outside edges. But see, now we don't have any points. I'm not sure if you could see that. I probably should have done that. So this is just kind of filtering out anywhere up on top. So we could do this and then emit from points. Now, the general idea with these drips is I want them to be, you know, pretty substantial, kind of like if you've ever seen like a gutter that's kind of pouring out extra water and stuff. You know, there's a little bit of surface tension, kind of a globby feel and things like that. Um, but it's also kind of sporadic. Um, it'll emit in areas and then disappear and um, emit from a new area and so on and so forth. So why don't we just go ahead and get rid of our scatter sop and use a slightly different method. Let's create an attribute wrangle and let's create an emit attribute. Let's call it F at emit so we're creating an emit attribute and let's put the x uh or the red channel of our color in there and so now you can see we have an emit attribute and then let's create a pop network and this is going to be a incredibly simple pop network now inside this pop network in our source we have an emission attribute where do you want to emit particles from if I were to hit play now, you let's turn off our guide. You kind of see it's just emitting all over the place. If we put emit in there, though, we're now only emitting from where the values are 0 and 1. And it's a probability. So it's going to emit more particles from the, the wider areas, which is exactly what we want. But instead of emitting 5,000, now constant is how many particles per second, impulses per frame. Uh, we can just keep it at per second. And 250. And there we go. Let's set our life expectancy to be 0 0.5. So it'll live half a second. And then plus or minus 0 0.2 seconds. So our particles will live between 0.3 and 0.7 seconds. And there, that looks great. All right, now I know you're probably thinking, okay, let's add gravity and so on and so forth, which we could do. And we could just do this all in the particle context, um, which is all fine. But because I was saying these, we want these guys to be kind of substantial, we want to actually, I was thinking we could use the vellum fluid uh, 
uh, which kind of has some constraints and, and allows some more globby surface tension, viscosity kind of stuff to go on that makes things just a little bit more interesting. So we're actually going to use these points as our emission points for our vellum fluid. So if we were to create a copy SOP, copy to points, because the vellum fluid needs a group of points, like a, um, a volume of points to emit from. Um, so we need to provide a volume. And if we just plug a sphere into there, all right, those spheres are huge and there's a ton of them. So let's go ahead and create another attribute wrangle. And this guy is going to be the one that's going to be responsible for our P scale. Now, it's always important when you're creating P scale on anything, especially when it comes to, to, to fluid simulations or particle simulations and stuff, to have a naturalistic distribution of P scale uh, or of scale of size. In order to create a naturalistic distribution, we want these to be a random size, right? So let's create a float and call it RND for rand. And let's just create a random number assigned to each particle. So we're going to put in at ID, or actually let's do at PT num. And I know, you, I know what you're gonna say. Wait a minute, these are particles. But we don't mind if the emitter changes size every frame. If we didn't want the size to change every frame, then yeah, we would use ID. Now let's create uh, F at P scale equals R and D. All right, so now we have our spheres varying between zero and one because Rand outputs a number between zero and one. Well, let's refit that because obviously these spheres are huge and just kind of think of, we want the spheres to be more in the, the scale of like a drip droplet size. So let's create a float and call it min and create a parameter min float max equals ch max. And then we're going to want to fit rand. So let's actually create float p scale type equals fit zero one rand or r and d between min and max. Right. So let's hit our parameter creation here. Oh, and then the other part is let me just separate this to p scale. There we go. All right, everything's zero, which looks correct. Let's have our max to be, say, 0 0.06 and the min to 0 0.03. All right, so that's all well and good now. So now we have kind of, it's a, the RAND is kind of a uniform distribution, but as things go in kind of a, a naturalistic, organic sort of way, the distribution of how things are uh, randomly propagated in nature is there's an extreme exponential curve to these values, meaning we have significantly more small scale than we do larger scale. And it's, you know, there's, there's lots of science and papers and stuff written on all of this. It's because, you know, the food, the based on the food chain and resources and stuff, you know, you've got a lot of small plants and then you might only have one big tree or one big bush. And that's because it's consuming more resources. And anyways, that aside, uh, we want to kind of implement something somewhat similar. So let's create a ramp before this P scale. Let's set R and D C H ramp rand distribution. And remember, I didn't put a space in there. Uh, R and D. All right. So I think this should all flow in because remember, the ramp expects a value between zero and one, which our R and D up here produces. 
and we're just storing it as a new value for R and D. So now we got that. So now, all right, let's just select this and select this because we don't want this linear interpolation. We can just select say B spline and we can start really sharply getting a fall off like that. All right, and I think that's about all we need. Now, if when I scrub, it's fairly slow because these spheres are fairly heavy with their resolution. Each one's 288 polys, and we've got, you know, this many points, so you multiply it up, it, you know, it, almost a million polys just for some spheres. So that's a bit extreme. Oh, and that was the other part. Okay, I, I was sitting here a bit confused. Max points per frame. All right, let's revert that. What I meant to set, we're emitting 5,000 per frame. Sorry. We actually want to set the constant birth rate to 250. All right, sorry about that. Let's rewind. And hit start. Okay, there, that's, that's acting better now. All right, I knew something was off and that's why. All right, so let's, we, as I was saying, we now want to create a vellum fluid. So in order to do it, we have to configure these spheres into vellum points. And there is a variety of vellum nodes out there to choose from. What we wanna choose is vellum configure grain. And we can just plug this in here. And we still have our spheres here. We haven't actually created the grain. So we want to tick on create points from volume and we lose everything. Well, it's because the particle size is 0.1, but our, you look at our P scale, it's less than 0.1. So it's just, we're too big. So let's set this to 0.008. All right, now we start having clusters of points, which is perfectly fine. Uh, we can turn on jitter scale because you can see these are in a perfect kind of grid distribution. Let's stick on jitter points so they just get more randomly distributed. Uh, let's also set the type to fluid. All right, so all that does is you'll notice we've got now some, some new attributes on here and it's just kind of setting some definitions there. I wanna uncheck display as spheres because I think that eats more memory and slows things down. Let's go ahead and tick on viscosity and surface tension. And you'll see when we tick those on, we now have a surface tension attribute and a viscosity attribute. And I think we can leave everything else. Oh, let's also uncheck this add sprite material. And I think we should be good to go. So we've got outputs now of this node and let's create uh, a null. So it's just easy to grab and we can just call this the geo and let's just copy and paste, call this constraints or com. So the way this node works is, and if you obviously dive in, you can see it's a whole doing a whole mess of stuff but it's obviously creating these points, assigning certain attributes, but then it actually is generating constraints between them that will the solver, the vellum solver looks at and helps determine how closely these, these guys stick together and, and when they get released and things like that. Um, we're not gonna do too much of a dive into all of that for this purpose, but let's create a DOP network and let's jump in and we're going to just kind of build this up from scratch so a vellum solver right we need a like type vellum solver and with any solver you need an object so let's create a vellum object and the object and solvers always go into the first input if you're ever not sure, you can just hover over and you can see it gives you the tips to uh, what goes where. 
And let's just plug this into output. And we rewind just to frame one. Now we have to actually bring in our particles or you know these guys that we just created, the geo and constraints. If we just wanted to emit once, we could put it in here and you would get, I think we would just get, yeah, and they all blow apart. It only emits just that one frame. This is the initial geometry. So this is more important, like if you have, you're doing vellum cloth or anything that you just don't want to keep emitting from over the course of the, the, the shot. So we can just go ahead and get rid of that uh, and actually source uh, similar to like how we would source particles. But in this case, we want to use a vellum source. And in our SOP path, we want to point to our geo and we can just copy that and on constraint. And now the emission type only once means it would do just as it does with the vellum object. Uh, we want to actually emit each substep. And we obviously need to hook this up into there. All right, so now we're getting constant emission, which is great. But obviously these don't look like drips because we need to add gravity. So let's add a gravity force there. This probably isn't gonna be a whole lot better, um, but at least it's going in the right direction. So on the vellum solver, we generally we always need to increase our substeps. Um, and actually in the help of the vellum solver, it does give you a tip that says, hey, if you're gonna be doing vellum fluid, start with these, these parameters. Uh, substeps of five, constraints to 20, um, smoothing iterations, I think it says three or five, something like that. But let's just go ahead and start there and then we can dial as we need. And let's hit play. All right, so it's starting to behave a little bit better now. So I think the thing we want to do now is under the advanced tab, under grain collisions, we don't really need for them to push themselves away because we want to try and keep some surface tension. So let's set that to zero. We actually want them to attract to themselves. So again, they're pulling themselves together. And then if we go to the fluids section, we've got a few different uh, parameters here. Let's just turn up the viscosity. And I'm actually gonna use a, a, a significantly higher value. And you can see now that viscosity parameter is really helping give us these kind of clumpy drips you know that it's, it's applying some surface tension and whatnot um we still have these like guys that are flying way off but um i think we can we can manage that and something also i want to note that i didn't at the very beginning um is we are starting at frame 1001 the reason for that and this is how most large production studios operate uh, is the frame 1001 is a good place to always have your shots start at because there's a lot of tools out there that do not like negative numbers. So if you need pre-roll, things like that, and sometimes you need, you know, more than 100 frames of pre-roll. So, you know, just over the years, just found, okay, we're going to, all our shots are going to start at frame 1001. So that's what I wanted to do here. All right, so I think that's looking pretty healthy. Uh, so let's jump back out and let's go ahead and save this out.
Now, I want to point out, though, before we save it out, it's creating a variety of different attributes. Uh, the vellum needs a lot of different things to look at and analyze and whatnot, uh, which is all well and good. But I also want to note, though, when you save attributes out, that quickly increases the file size of your, your caches. And while this simulation is, is not too intense, especially when you get into large scale simulations with millions, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of points um, or voxels or anything, every attribute counts. So, you know, if you have twice as many attributes that you need, well, your file cache is gonna be twice as big because just, you know, each attribute is a number that it has to store somewhere. So it's always good to just clean out all the stuff you don't need. Oftentimes, I, you know, I have been burned in the past where I'm like, oh, I really needed that attribute, and then you have to resim it. But in this case, since I've already done this, uh, I can tell you the only thing we need is our uh, velocity attribute. So we can just say delete everything except, so we can use that caret v. All right, so actually, yeah. You can just do v, delete non-selected. And look. Now we have just V. And then we also have this point group. Point group, you can also delete if you want. And then let's create a file cache. Save it to an appropriate location. I'm just going to call it. Actually, I don't think I need to put the V in there. I think it'll do it based on this parameter. And we'll just call this drip sim. All right, I'm going to write this out. And then in the next video, we'll kind of refine this a little bit further. And then we'll be done with the drips. One thing I do want to point your attention to before you kick off the sim, uh, something I added to make the simulation more efficient. If we go inside the dopnet, I just added this pop kill. And on the drop down here, there's an example kill by condition. And basically, it just will kill any particle. And I set that goes below zero uh, in Y. And because there's no point in simulating particles that you're never going to see. So now let's take a look at what we got. And it's working pretty well. We've got some nice kind of surface tension globs and things like that, they are a bit large when we do kind of look relative to the rest of our scene. And we'd like to have a bit finer um, kind of drips when we kind of look at our environment. So there's some post-processing we can do to these points to, to make it a little bit more interesting and in the right scale. One thing is the attribute blur SOP. This is a really useful SOP to make nice organic kind of features and whatnot. Let's set the blurring iterations to five. And let's set it by proximity. And by setting it by proximity, you're going to notice all of a sudden, it's going to get these really nice strings. We got this nice sheeting and whatnot. Um, so it does work really well uh, to getting these organic effects. And what this is really doing is it's searching within this radius finding this many neighbors and essentially averaging, but it's not, well, it's doing more than average. Uh, it's using this, uh, this algorithm, this Laplacian algorithm to, to, to blur these guys. So you get a, a pretty nice effect. And that feels a lot more appropriate now. We do also have these stray particles out here and while we could leave these if we wanted to filter those out we can do another step uh, which is kind of doing a similar thing uh, that the attribute blur is where it's searching for its neighbors and uh, let's create an attribute vop and in this case we're going to create a point cloud and so you can see there's a few different options available to us Let's use point cloud open. Now there's a variety of different inputs. So what a point cloud does is 
based on the input you give it, it will then search in that in a specific radius for all its neighbors up to the number you specify. So you can see on the PC open, we have a search radius, we have a number of points. So it's going to ten, take the 10 closest points, and then you can extract an attribute from those points. And you can filter them, or you can grab a particular neighbor's attribute. Uh, it's a really useful feature to sample the locations or positions. Or So this is going to really help us figure out which neighbors uh, are these stray points. So in the inputs, we want to sample ourselves. So we can just plug in our first input. And the sample position is obviously going to be P. Now we've got it all stored in what they call a handle. All those neighbors are stored there. And we can then do a variety of different operations. Uh, you can find the farthest, the closest, uh, or nearest. But what I want to do is point cloud num found. So this is actually going to tell us how many neighbors it's actually found in this specified radius. And so let's also promote up. So I can middle mouse, promote up radius, promote up max points. And then just double click on that thing to expose these. And what I want to do now is refit our numbers found between a zero to one range. So let's create a fit range. And we want to fit the number of neighbors. So if it found the maximum number of points, we want the value to be one. Or, and if it could only find one point, meaning a point that's by itself, we want it to be zero and everything in between. All right, so let's plug our max points here. And it's never going to find zero points. It's always going to find at least one point because it's going to find itself because we are sampling itself. Now let's plug this into color. And come up. All right, so now everything is white. Uh, there's actually just a couple that are dark um, or black. Um, so let's kind of tweak these a little bit. So if we turn this radius down, we can now start seeing we're filtering out because each point is looking within this radius trying to find up to 10 points. So within this radius, 0 0.01, if we were to set a p-scale and copy a sphere to each one, you could see that, visualize that radius. You can see, oh, it can't find anything. So we're now returning just itself. Uh, we can turn this up even more. The number of points we want it to find. And then we can create a blast. And in this blast, we can just say at CD equals zero. And you do need to set this to points. And one thing, uh, if you haven't written an expression in a blast app before, you can't have any spaces. All right, so that does a pretty good job getting rid of those points. And the last thing I want to do is now set a P scale. So let's create an attribute wrangle. And we'll probably nudge this around when we actually get into rendering these. But what I found that worked is at P scale equals 0 0.002. And just copy to points just to visualize this a bit better. And let's set this to primitive because again, this is just for visualizing. You can even pack an instance if you want it to go faster. I'll turn this off for visualizations. And that feels like it works pretty well. You can even take it a step further uh, because we do have some like gray shaded areas, some values in between the, the black and white. We can multiply this P scale 
dot x, the red channel. We can multiply it uh, by the color. So as they get closer and closer to being by themselves, they they shrink and scale. All right, and then generally at the end of an effect, it's always kind of good to put a null there so you know what node to grab when you want to start bringing it into Karma or exporting it via a ROP um, so you know uh, where to grab it. So you're not having to find some arbitrary name, attribute wrangle, something like that. So how it drops. All right, so I think that completes this element. In the next video, we will take a look at uh, creating some puddles now. All right, so we've created our drips. Now let's create some puddles. So we're creating a new element. So let's create a new geometry object and we'll just call this puddle. And let's dive in and let's merge in our ground. An object merge, ENV, and this actually lives under the extra elements null. All right, and for the sake of this example, the ground that I want to look at is this down here. This is where I want to apply our puddles. So I'm just going to select, and if I hit the nine key, it's going to allow me to select based on connectivity and the groups. So I'm gonna select the ground, and then I'm just gonna hit the delete key. All right, so now we want to apply our puddles to this ground surface. And we're gonna do that using something called the shallow water solver. So why don't we just go ahead and drop one of those down so we can just kind of take a quick look at what that expects. This is new in, I think, 19.5. All right, it's got a variety of different parameters and whatnot. Um, but the part I want to focus your attention on is it's requiring a height field. So this needs a height field to apply this simulation on. All right, so let's create a height field. So what a height field is, if you've never used these before, is it's essentially, it's a 2D volume. If we were to middle mouse on it and you look, there's two different fields and they have an X, a Y, and a Z resolution. You'll always see in the Z resolution, it's a single value. And so it's a 2D volume, which means you can run these things really efficiently. Um, each voxel stores a single value, and that single value is typically the Y height. It's how high up the, the voxel is. And while this, you're not actually moving any voxels, it's storing that information. So when you do convert it to a renderable topology like polygons or something, it will say, oh, this polygon needs to be this high, or this point needs to be this high in Y. That's all it's doing. So there's a whole suite of tools that Houdini provides, and it allows you to create really cool environments and things like that. But for our example, we just want to use it for this shallow water solver. Now, you'll see that this thing comes in huge because it's expecting you to build a mountainscape or some kind of massive landscape. We don't need to do that. So let's just set our size to be oh, 07 and 4 or somewhere around there. And we should probably template our geometry. And now let's move in our viewport. Let's look through our camera because that's the part that matters. All right, we can make this a bit bigger here. Did I just shoot it off? No, we're okay. Okay, somewhere around there. Um, one thing though, well here, I'll leave this as is and, and just so you can see. Um, but what I was gonna say, we don't really wanna go under the eave here, but I'll show you that in a second. Oh, I know why that's popping. Okay, the reason that's popping is 
So it's saying each voxel is two meters wide. So that's huge, especially when we're working in a space like this. Uh, let's turn that grid spacing down to 0 0.008. So there we go. Okay, so that's a lot more appropriate now. There's a lot more voxels to populate. Okay, something like this. Let's just kind of keep it over our our floor here. All right, well, there's no information in this height field. Everything's just set at zero. But we want this height field to take the properties or the profile of our uneven ground terrain. So we can do that using a height field project, which basically is doing just that. It is casting array and there we go so again if i were to go into wireframe mode you can see the bounds of our geometry or our height field hasn't changed but when i go into smooth shaded this is just visualizing what those voxel values are storing and this also illustrates what i was talking about we don't want to uh deal with this. We can create a separate height field if we wanted puddles to be up there. That's probably how I would do it. Uh, but for the sake of this example, uh, why don't we just shrink this down so we just don't have to be in that business? Because that will also affect how our white, uh, our shallow water solver behaves. Okay, somewhere around there is good. All right, so we have our height field. If we were to plug this into the shallow water solver, oh, let me make sure I'm on, roll back to frame one. And if I hit play, okay, there's nothing happening. So we need to give it a little bit more information. If we look at the, uh, well, we've got all our simulation stuff, but in particular, we have to provide a source in the binding. So these are basically all the inputs it's expecting. Uh, you want to source your water from somewhere. So let's create a mask and specify where we want our puddles to be. So I'm going to create a height field by mask. So there's quite a few. All right. Height field mask by object. And in the second input, let's create a grid. Now this grid size, we want to just kind of put it seven, just over where our ground is. Just kind of move it there. Maybe a little bit smaller, just so we're inside. So got it there. And on the parameters here, on the height field mask by object, right now it's going to build this mask, where we see in red, on either side of this geometry. But we actually want to set it to above height field. So that means we're only going to be projecting from one side of it. So let's go ahead and nudge our mask up to point 0 0.01. And now if I middle mouse, you can see we have our height field, we have our mask field. Let's plug this into our shallow water solver. And if we hit play, again, nothing happens. Because our source layer is expecting a field called source. But in our case, our field is called mask. So we could do one of two things. We can either rename mask to source, or we can just type mask in here. And now it's doing something. If I hit play, all right, perfect, job done. Yeah, so there's clearly some, some things we need to, to adjust. So let's go into our setup. And in the source scale, I found this to be the biggest factor. I found that you had to turn this way down. Now if I hit play, all right, it's doing something a bit more pleasing. It's tough to visualize, so why don't we go ahead in our output, change visualization, color by water layer. 
And let's dial this parameter to something much smaller. 0 0.05 works for me. All right, so we're getting some nice ripples now. But you can see we hit play, they emit, and then that's it. So it really only occurs, and let's look through our camera, on the first frame. Back on our setup tab, we can turn our source frequency from initialize only to once per frame. And if we hit play, it behaves a bit better, but the sourcing is eventually becomes under the, the, the fluid here, and therefore we just don't ever really see it again. You can still kind of see there are some waves there. But what we're going to want to do is we're actually going to want to create little raindrops to create a ripple effect. And I think maybe this was the intention of the shallow water solver is to kind of replace the ripple solver. All right, so let's go back up here and let's create a scatter sop. And in the group, we want to scatter based on where the mask is. So only we only want raindrops to be hitting where we have the water. And now let's create an attribute wrangle because we want to set a scale on these drops. And we can refine this later, but let's just say at p scale equals 0 0.05. And let's also set the scatter amount to something like 50. And let's create a copy to points and a sphere. All right, so this is essentially emulating where we want our drops to occur, but you see they're all static. We want them to change. So let's change them every frame. So we can just put $F in there. But right now that's pretty fast. Generally when a drop hits, we want it to sustain for a couple frames. So what we can do is, right now the seed is changing every frame. If we were to divide by three, we're left now with a decimal place. And you can see it's every third frame, it becomes an integer, which is now what we can do is we can take the floor of this expression, which means the floor means it's going to drop the decimals. It's only going to take the integer. So now every third frame, the seed changes. All right, that works for me. So now to be able to feed this into our shallow water solver, we need to create a mask out of this. So in a similar fashion, we can create a height field mask by object. And there we go. We've got a mask now. Let's actually plug this into our shallow water solver. All right, so that's working pretty well. And we could just let this ramp up until we get enough fluid in our on our ground here. Because you can see every time one of those spheres hit, we get a new a new ripple. But if we wanted to say start with an initial puddle and then apply these drops to that. So what we can do, we can create a switch sop. And we can feed our initial water which is this mask here into the first input. We can feed our mask that we're creating with our raindrops into the second input. And in this expression here, we can just say something like $F greater than 1001, because that's our start frame. Now, if we plug that in, we've got our initial fluid, 
and we've got our drops. Now something that I, I think helps, because you can see on the bottom right here, we're getting some artifacting on the shallow water solver. Let's do a couple things. Let's on the simulation tab, let's set our sub steps to 20. And on our setup, let's enable dampening layer because right now those ripples will just keep propagating uh, by dampening it. Uh, and we don't need, well, let's see what 25 does. That really stomps down on on what we're getting i think it's a bit too aggressive for our needs so let's just set this dampening to one so that i think is working fairly well why don't we now create a few more of these drops but as you can see these are changing every third frame all in unison so let's copy and paste this and let's apply an offset. So it can just be plus a number, doesn't really matter what. And merge this with this. So now we'll have a little bit more variation. And we can just go ahead and copy really do this as many times as we want or need. Uh, let's do a third one and put just another offset in there. So we've got three sets of points that live for three, three different frame periods. And back to our P scale here, why don't we add some variation to the P scale? Let's create a float call it rand and let's just say rand at pt num and let's let's create a float min and a float max and we want to fit our rand between uh, fit zero one, sorry, fit zero one, around between zero, or between min and max. So our new min and new max. So I felt 0 0.05 worked pretty well. So why don't we create a 0 0.08 and something like 0 0.02 for our min. So I felt those parameters work pretty well. Let's go back to our first frame. Uh, sometimes you, so when you see this blue cache there, uh, that means it's holding on to it. Let's reset it. All right, so we've got nice rain puddles. All right, there's one more step I wanna do. If we kind of think about our environment now, we've got this whole puddle occurring underneath our roof, which I don't want. I really only want it to be outside the roof because this roof is supposed to be doing its job and making sure we are not getting a bunch of rain and puddles and whatnot. So let's grab all of this and let's just kind of shift this up a bit. And let's create a new object merge and let's merge in our roof. Go into our ENV, out roof. And there we go. All right, we can use a similar method that we did with the grid, uh, mask by object. And we can plug our roof in there. And now we can see it is creating a mask there, which kind of works, but really we want this mask to be everywhere but under the roof. So we've got this guy, invert mask. Okay, great. But we're stomping on 
this that we just created. We spent all that hard work creating. So we want to merge it. And really what we want to do is we want to multiply. We want to multiply this mask with this mask. So we're only left with the outside areas. So to combine with existing, we can set this to multiply. And sure enough, there we go. We can go into Cam Master. Now we could do some further masking because obviously our, our roof ends there. So we can, instead of just taking the roof, we can feed this into a bound. Because all it's doing is the height field is projecting up to this to figure out where that object is. So it really can be any object you want. Uh, we could have just put another grid in there. But I want to, I believe it's negative, the lower padding. Yeah, there we go. So there. All right, so now it's gotten rid of all of that. You can see. And now let's take a look at what we got. Okay, I think that works pretty well. And you can obviously, if you want more puddles, you can nudge this up further, say zero two. And the nice thing is it's going to just propagate. Uh, but I think for this example, because I do like kind of having a little bit more negative space and whatnot. Um, so we've created this simulation of our sh shallow water. That's all well and good, but you can look, it's all in the height fields. How do we actually render this thing or get this into something that's going to be helpful? Well, we want to convert our height field into geometry. Uh, and we can do that. First, we can just strip out all the other fields. So we just want the height field and we can say delete non-selected and convert height field. And this is the, the thing that will take all those voxel values and say, okay, I'm now going to set these points at the, the location that the height field is telling me. And we'll create a null out puddle. And now when you get into the business of rendering, something that you'll notice if I were to they just come through a few frames. Our water does have thickness, but there's a lot of areas that in our height field that do not have any thickness. Um, there's no water there or anything like that. And so this could become problematic. You can see how polys are intersecting each other with our ground. Um, we actually don't really need to render that. So we can just kind of nudge those things below our ground. So the only thing that shows up is just where our water is. So if we just nudge this down, you can see we only are left with where our water puddles are, as you can see here. Okay, great. Well, that's it for puddles. All right, so we're building up our layers and the next task I wanna take a look at is adding some life to our leaves and branches here. Uh, obviously in a rainstorm, those things would be getting hit by drops and you'd be getting little flutters and, and movement on there as well as maybe just some kind of ambient noise uh, being applied to the whole thing. Now I really enjoyed this section uh, that we're about to cover. This actually, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of ways that we could just look at doing some kind of vellum sim or, you know, some kind of simulation, which is which is totally fine and 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 perfectly reasonable. But I want to take a different approach because these things are small and we've got hundreds of leaves. And I think this technique could actually be applied to an environment that had substantially more leaves, um, you do start hitting a wall on what you can simulate and what 
you kind of need to, to think of different methods on. Um, and so in this case, I want to create, create a procedural system uh, and dive into uh, manipulating, rotating, um, applying noise uh, to their, their transformation matrices. Um, and so we're going to get into a little bit more technical kind of matrix related functions and, and whatnot, but um, I know it can be overwhelming, but I think at the same time, you'll, you'll at least, we'll kind of pull back the curtain on how all of 3D functions and applications and just in general, how this, this whole technology is able to work. And it's largely revolves around a lot of matrix math and, and whatnot. So uh, why don't we just dive right in um, and let's create a geometry object and we can call this leaves. And we'll go in and just for visualization, I'm just gonna hide other objects and let's create an object merge. And like we've done before, go into our ENV and let's grab our plants. And again, let's take a look, a uh, bunch of attributes on there. Let's do an attribute delete that we wanna strip off. Oh, P scale, that U's not doing much for us. Um, alpha, might as well get rid of that, get rid of that. And if we look from our camera, which we are, and we hit play, again, there's no motion on these leaves yet. So there's quite a lot that we do need to do to prep this geometry in order to isolate our leaves and, and whatnot. But before we actually dive into just, okay, here's the nodes and we're gonna layer up a bunch of nodes and functions and, and, and you know, then we'll be done. Uh, I'd rather kind of just take a moment to break down how a transformation matrix is built. So let's go ahead and move this aside and we'll kind of create just a, a test case. Let's create a grid. And let's set this grid to be one by one, just a bit smaller. And let's obviously view it. All right, we have our grid. And let's put down a transform node. And I know this is about as simple as it gets, but again, there's it's all for the greater good. All right, we have our functions or our parameters, translate, rotate, scale, which you guys are all familiar with. Uh, let's put a transform and say negative two. Let's rotate on the Z axis 60 degrees and let's scale an X 1.5. All right, nothing too exciting here. So something I do wanna though further dive into. So one thing I do want to bring your attention to though, is you see this transform order. We have scale, rotate, translate. What that means, that's the order on which it's applying each one of these transformations. It's first applying the scale, second applying the rotation, and third applying the translate. So if we were to create a transform here, and do it in that same order. So it was scaling 1.5. And then if we were to create a new transform, rotate, what did we say, 60? And another transform scale, or I'm sorry, another transform to translate negative two, I believe. Uh, that should be identical, right? Yeah. And, but obviously if we were to change the order of these and how these are applied, we're gonna get very different results. Let me just template this. Or we do that order. 
you're going to get very different results, all depending on the order on which those things are applied, because everything is multiplicative. Uh, and obviously, you don't need to break it out like this. You do have the flexibility to uh, change these things uh, up here and the order which they're applying to the matrix. Uh, so just be aware of that. That's a really important thing as we start building this setup is the order on which we're doing things. Um, and furthermore, we have a pivot. So in our pivot transform, I do that. All right. This is the pivot on which our object is rotating around. So it's everything will rotate around this point location, as you can see there. So that's also a really important thing. So a rotation requires uh, a matrix that it's going to rotate. It needs a pivot on which it's going to rotate the geometry around. And it also needs the angle it's going to rotate the geometry around as oh and as well as the axis in which case ours is z all right so let's just go back to 60 let's set our pivot back to zero so if we wanted to create this in vax as that's what we're going to be needing to do let's put our guy here and the first thing we want to do, because this is a matrix, uh, meaning it has four rows and four columns. That's a standard four, what they call a four by four matrix. And that stores all the numbers for rotation, scales, translates, and, and then it does all the, the math, the multiplication and whatnot, and spits out uh, here, here's your, uh, here's your values uh, and what it's going to do. So it spits out what it does in the end. All right, so first let's create a matrix. So to create a matrix in Vex, it's just type it on, I gotta first spell it right. Matrix, and we can just give it a name. So a matrix is just a variable, M equals ident. So that's just an empty, an identity matrix. So that's just an empty matrix. And if we wanted to rotate, let's create a rotation. Let's create a float and we need an angle to rotate. Now, all these matrices do things in radians, not in degrees. So we do probably want to convert our angle from degrees to radians. The input needs to be radians. Uh, so let's go ahead and we'll create a parameter ch deg for degrees. But like I said, it needs to be radians. So there's a function called radians where it'll take whatever the input in is and change it from degrees to radians. So that makes it happy for all this stuff we're going to do. All right, so we have our angle. Now, if we look, okay, we need this on an axis. And in this case, we're doing it on Z, the Z axis. So the create a variable called vector axis equals set zero, zero, one. So that's just a vector. So we want to rotate around the Z axis. Now what we can do is we can call a function called rotate and it requires three inputs. The first input is our matrix. The second input is our amount or our angle, right? That's our float. And then the third is the axis which we want to rotate around. So M angle axis. So this is a function. It doesn't actually return anything in the sense of like we need to plug it into a variable. What it's doing is it's actually applying it to this first input, this matrix input. So that all that's being done now. Well, we haven't seen anything change on here because remember, these are all just, this is still just it's doing the math, but now we got to actually apply this to our geometry. And we can do that by putting at P and 
if you want to apply a matrix uh, to your geometry, it's generally always multiplicative. Uh, so just be times equals, which is just a shorthand way of saying position equals position times the matrix. And, oh, the other thing we got to do, because right now we're rotating at zero degrees because we haven't exposed this parameter. So now if I put 60 in here, there we go, 60, great. And looks to be on the same axis or the same, looks like it's rotating the same degrees. Well, now let's do the same for translating and scaling. And let's do it in the order which we have. So we've got scale, rotate, translate. So let's create a, a scale. So a scale is just a vector. So let's create a vector scale equals, and in our case, it's 1.511. 1 and now let's create, there's a scale function and we are going to scale our matrix. So M by our scale variable. All right, and sure enough, it scales up. And finally, we need to translate. So let's create the same thing. Vector trans equals set, what do we say? Negative two by zero by zero. And then down here, translate M by that amount. And there we go, which in the same spot, if I put our display, see? All right, so that's starting to get into a little bit of what we're going to now explore with our leaves. Obviously we're doing this on a single grid uh, and we need to apply this actually on hundreds of leaves. So there's gonna be a lot of loops and things like that, but again, hopefully it'll make sense. All right, and so something you might be asking that we didn't cover is, well, what if we wanted to change the pivot? All of these functions that we're doing on this matrix are assuming the pivot is at zero, zero, zero. So we have to kind of trick it by essentially providing an offset to our point position, multiply the matrix in that offset position, and then move it back. So if we were to, in our guy here, just to make sure we're matching one-to-one, -one, we're offsetting in the translate X by two units. Well, let's do the same here. So let's create a vector called pivot. And let's just set the same value in there. All right, so again, it, the, the assumption is that the matrix is at zero, 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 and so in order to multiply the matrix to our point position, we need to offset our points. So if we do minus equals pivot, and let's take a look here, just what we're doing. So you can see before and after. So we're offsetting. And then from here, we want to rotate, scale, and translate down to there. But if we look, we now need to then take away this pivot. So essentially invert it. So instead of subtracting, we're going to add. And it should put everything now in the right spot. So that's how pivots are incorporated in doing these matrix functions. But all the scales rotate and translate, everything needs to get moved back to the origin, applied, multiply your position, and then you offset it back. So pivot is kind of the similar thing as, as offset. All right, so jumping back over to our leaves and branches and all of that, before we start, figuring out all the matrix stuff we need to do, angles and pivots and, and rotations. We first need to just filter out and isolate where our leaves are. So by kind of moving around a bit, you can see the stems are these tubes. 
The leaves are just kind of these flat planes. So I found the best way, and obviously there's always a variety of different ways of, of doing the same thing. Found though that measuring the curvature is a good way to filter the leaves from the stems. We want to change on the measure from area to curvature. And it gives us this color visualization. If you don't have this right away, you might just need to hit enter in the viewport and it'll invoke this visualizer, which is pretty useful. But what you'll notice though, is when we look at the leaf, it's actually measuring it on a per primitive basis. I want to account for this entire leaf. So there's this option per piece, and it's going to look for an attribute that you provide and it'll basically compute the curvature for that entire piece at, based on that attribute. And we can create the piece attribute using what's called a connectivity SOP. And what this is going to do, it's going to give a unique integer based on how these primitives are connected. If I were to just uh, create a color, just so you guys can see what's going on. We look at the attribute value as well. It's a primitive attribute and class. So zero to 5,091. You scroll, yeah. And just to furthermore, so we can actually make sense of those numbers, let's do random from attribute. This is going to be a primitive color, class. And sure enough, all right, we've got a unique color for each leaf and object in the scene. All right, let me get rid of that. All right, so let's take a look. And obviously our most extreme curvature is uh, the red. And that looks like it's doing a pretty good job of filtering. So let's create a blast sop. And it's created an attribute, if we middle mouse, called curvature. At curvature, let's do less than four. And if we do delete non-selected, we now have pretty much just the leaves. But let's just double check just to confirm. Looks like there's some stuff over there. So it does look like it's not actually accounting for these branches. I think part of the reason is these are not tubes. These branches are just planes that are intersecting. So something we should probably do then is if we just basically do a further refinement and measure those guys, same situation, and then a blast. at curvature less than one. Let's just make sure we didn't. All right, so I think we're good now. So now that we've isolated our leaves, we can actually start figuring out all the information we need to apply a custom rotation on a per leaf basis. So what's gonna make this a lot easier, as you can see, you can see each leaf, whoops, is made up of multiple polys or multiple primitives. Ideally, I think what would make this a lot easier is if we just isolate it down to or refine each leaf into a single primitive. So let's create a divide stop. and remove shared edges. So basically that's going to look and it's going to any primitives that share an edge, it's gonna collapse those edges. And so now we're just left with uh, only the exterior edges and we essentially just have a single primitive per leaf. And now we can start iterating over each one of these leaf, find the, the specific pivot, pivot we want, apply a unique rotation uh, on each leaf and so on and so forth. All right, and so in order to do this, the first step, what I wanna do is figure out where the closest point on this leaf is to the 
corresponding stem. So if we go back up here to our original model, I want to find where on the stem each leaf is located, where that position is, and essentially that's where I want the pivot rotation to be applied for the leaf. So let's create an attribute wrangle. And let's feed in our stems. So first we need to, we did all these blasts, which is all well and good. Let's copy and paste this one. And do uncheck, delete, non-selected. And then we want to do the same down here because we did refine it a further step down here. And let's merge these two together. So this should just leave everything else but our leaves. Okay, so that's pretty much our stems. So let's plug this into the second input of our wrangle. And what I want to use to find the closest point or the closest point on the stem, we can use an expression called XYZ dist. And if we take a look at that, ah, not XYS, XYZ dist. And you can see basically we need the geometry that it's going to look at and then the origin on where we want to look from. And then it's essentially just searching around until it finds the closest point. Well, it's not actually the closest point. It's the closest point on surface. And then we can get it to return a couple different attributes. We can find the primitive, which it's closest to, as well as the parametric UV coordinate. Now, let me kind of break this down in a little bit. All right, so we have say our stem here and we'll just say it's made up of these polys right so when i say parametric coordinate every poly has and this is a this is just a um an intrinsic of a primitive it has a zero to one space so how and it, this depends on how that that poly is constructed so it basically would just go zero to one, zero to one, or this would be zero and one, something like that. And then everything in between. So, you know, if you're familiar with how UVs work, it's, it's a very similar thing. Um, it's a parametric coordinate. And if our leaf, say if the stem of our leaf is here, we're you now, it's going to take every point that we iterate over and that XYZ is going to say, where's the closest point, all right? And it's gonna say somewhere around there. Well, this is gonna be primitive zero, this is prim one, this is prim two, this is prim three and so on. Uh, so it'll say, oh, the closest primitive to your leaf is two and the location is actually at say, you know, 0 0.5, sorry guys, I'm drawing with a mouse. And I didn't actually, 0, 1, these actually should have two coordinates. Uh, this is 0, 0, that's 0, 1, that's uh, 1, 0, and this would be 1, 1. Um, so 0 0.5 and 0 0.4, let's say, or something like that. So that's what it's going to return for us. So let's take a look at our inputs. All right. So it returns a float, which is the distance that your closest location is. And then you can see how there's this int with the ampersand prim and vector ampersand UV. That means if you provide those, it's going to write those values, the primitive and UV to those uh, variables. So let's create a float and we can just call it dist, XYZ dist. And then we'll give it one because we want to look up the first geometry stream or the second geometry stream at the location from our point location. And then we want to store it. And I haven't actually created these variables yet, but let's just call it stem 
Prim and stem UV. All right, so let's go ahead and create these because if we just hit enter, it'll complain that those aren't defined. So a primitive is just a primitive number. So stem prim equals, well, we don't actually need to assign it. If we don't assign it anything, it'll probably just be zero, I believe. And vector stem UV. And now what we can do is vector stem pause. So we can get the position of that location. So we've got the, we have the primitive and then we have the UV, the parametric UV of that. And what I want to retrieve is the position of that. You can look up any attribute at that location. You know, if there's colors on those primitives or normals or whatever it is, you can look it up using the prim UV function. So with this, it's the same deal. So the geometry that we want to look up is our second input. And we want to grab the position of the second input at on this primitive at this parametric location and what we can do just for sanity check is we can int new point we can create a point at that location if we really wanted to here and at stem pause we can create a new point and sure enough for every single prim now if we were to look we can see that's where each leaf is returning and we could obviously you know add attributes so we could isolate each point to its corresponding leaf and whatnot so for every point on this leaf we are now creating a point on a the closest stem to it so obviously we do not want every single one of these points we want the closest one right so we we have this attribute called dist and we're going to want to filter it down so we are only getting the closest point because obviously when we kind of take a look at say for example this point on this leaf here is potentially grabbing something on this stem. So we know that for this leaf, we want the pivot to be somewhere here. We want it to be the closest point position on there. So let's go ahead and create a new wrangle. But before we do, we want to pass some of these uh, variables down that we can pick up downstream. So let's go ahead and just get rid of this new point. And let's store f at dist. We can just store our disk there. We can stem prim for our primitive. And let's go ahead and grab our stem UV. We very well could do all this in one wrangle, but I this does this wrangle does get pretty big. So I think if we can compartmentalize each thing, it's easier to kind of Go back and understand what's going on and 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 all of that so it kind of keeps things organized all right so the next step is create another wrangle and we're going to feed our stems into the second input so what i want to do as i said before when we were looking up those attributes and where it created those points just for visualization purposes, it was kind of just creating them um, based on each and every point's closest location to the stem. We want to filter that down on a per primitive basis. So each primitive has a single point, and that essentially is going to be, or a single location. And that location will become our pivot that we do our rotating on. So I want, instead of running over each and every point, I just want to run over each and every primitive here. So each and every leaf. So this will run once for each and every leaf. So let's start by creating an array though. For each leaf, we want to collect all the points in that single leaf. And then we'll filter each point so we can identify what is the right value that we, we want to grab. So we can just create an array. Int points equals prim points and 
the first input is what we want at prim num. So what this is going to do, it's going to cycle through every primitive and it's going to grab all the point numbers and store them in this array. If we were to put that in an attribute, we could just do that. And if we look in our spreadsheet, you can see, so for primitive zero, this, these are all the point numbers for that primitive and prim one and two and so on and so forth. So we need to identify of this list of points that we have here for this primitive, which one of these points is closest to the stem. Then that point's stem position is going to be our pivot location. So let's go ahead and get rid of that because we don't really need it. And storing arrays does get does get kind of heavy, especially. I mean, in this case, it's fine, but um, you know, if you're if you're dealing with large amounts of geometry, arrays can get can be pretty uh, pretty inefficient. So only use them when you need them. All right. So what I want to do now is iterate. All right. So we can keep that there, um, but just note that arrays, especially when you're dealing with with large sets of geometry and whatnot, arrays can get heavy because they are storing a lot of a lot of data. So especially if you're writing them out or anything like that, it's best to strip all that stuff if you don't need it. All right, so I wanna iterate through each point and figure out which one's the closest one to the stem. So we're gonna use a for each loop and we have to set a value that we're going to store the current iteration. So we'll just call it point and PT semicolon. And then the array that we're going to iterate through, which is PTS and we need curly brackets on either side. All right. So first I want to grab for each point, I want to grab its current distance that it is from the stem. So it's always important to, when you're creating a new variable, to do it outside of a loop. Because in order for the loops to execute, they often, all those things need to be established first. So let's go ahead and create a float per dist. And now let's write cur dist equals point zero. We're gonna use the point expression and we're gonna grab that attribute that we wrote out called dist, and we're going to look at the point we're iterating on. So cur dist is now going to store, okay, what is my distance? And then all we wanna do is do a comparison. We wanna compare on its last iteration, are you bigger or smaller? And if you're smaller, great, you're now going to be the winner. And we're gonna keep doing that as it filters through and what we'll be left with by the end of the loop is the one that is the smallest value. So we can do that by saying if the current distance is less than the minimum distance, and I know this this will make sense in just a second. So we, we call a new value min dist. So let's establish what that is. This is just a kind of get things rolling. So min dist equals, let's just set a big number, a thousand, right? So that way the first point, no matter what, will enter this. So if the current distance, so let's just say the current distance, let's actually just take a look at our values of what our dist is. So it's a point attribute. Okay, 0 0.004, 0 0.005, you know, we can just, 0.1. So they're all pretty much 0.1 and less. All right. So just think of this logic. If the current distance, if this is less than min dist, enter this if statement, which we are. If it is less than that, then I want min dist to equal per dist. All right. So by doing that now, if say min dist, so min dist is a thousand on the first iteration, it enters. And if current distance is less than this, well then if current distance, we'll just say is 0 0.1, min dist is gonna be 0 0.1. Then the next time this iterates on the next point, 
it's going to say, if say the current distance here is 0 0.08, if 0 0.08 is less than 0 0.1, go in and now you're 0 0.08. Now let's say the next iteration, it says current distance is 0 0.09. Well, 0 0.09 is not less than 0 0.08. So it's just gonna go to the next one and so on and so forth. So in by doing that, we're going to filter down to the smallest point for each primitive. So we've gotten the distance, which is all well and good, but I also want to then make sure we save that point. And let's just call it min point. It's our min point equals point equals this guy. And we need to establish this variable. So let's go up here, int min pt. And again, you can assign it. It's always safe if you do assign it, especially if it's a point number, because point numbers are all uh, positive integers, well, including zero. Um, so just set it to negative one. That's fine. And just to take a look at the output now, let's set i at uh, min pt equals pt. And let's see if, ah, no, not pt, min pt. And let's take a look. And this is, because we're running this on primitives, this becomes a primitive attribute, um, min point. All right, so if we are to look, minimum point is found 9991, and sure enough, there's 9991. So this number should correspond to a number within this array. And I bet if we were to, here, let me go to prim zero just for sanity checking. Okay, 14. Let's go ahead and just blow away primitive zero, uh, isolate or isolate primitive zero. All right, so it's saying the closest point is 14 out of all these points here. Now, all right, let's hope one of these points here is 14. Ah, and sure enough, there it is. There's point 14, and that is, yes, because if we look at zero, that is kind of jutting really inside there. So I bet it was a close race between 14 and 15, but um, that is the closest point now. So great, all right, we've got our point established. And now we're gonna wanna look up some information about that point. Some of these attributes which we stored on, on that point. So let's go ahead and take a break. And in the next video, we'll kind of dive into that. Congratulations, you made it through the first week. So we have taken a, a number of steps to create these drips and the puddles. And I know we left you on a bit of a cliffhanger with the, the transformation matrices, with the leaves. But the thing about watching tutorials and videos is it makes perfect sense as you're following things step by step. Um, and I think a big part of the experience an effects artist gains is when they are actually left to do it on their own, to take the concepts you've learned over the, the time you've, you've been doing effects and actually applying it to something. Um, so what I would like you to do in this, uh, this week is to grab a different model it could be, I mean, you could you could just grab the, you know, one of the, the models that do come in with Houdini, these test geometry ones, or if you have another model uh, from somewhere else, could even be just like a, a, a few noisy spheres. But I would like to see what you can do um, as far as applying these effects, um, drips, puddles, maybe underneath, maybe these drips fall into a, the puddle and create the ripples using the same techniques. And then what would even be cooler is if you were to apply a rotation using the stuff, the techniques that we have done uh, with the leaves. So you get some deformation and introduce that into uh, how this these drips and uh, effects respond to that transformation.
All right. Well, I look forward to seeing what you all will be posting. Thank you.